Okay, what my role um, in this presentation is to talk about uh, me or the SRC, uh, not so much specifically about what we do, but as uh, our role within the Honey um, Partnership or Consortium. Um, we're in the very, very fortunate position of actually being one of the net contributors to Honey, so our, we're actually putting in more money than we're taking out. So these guys are in, my, in that sense my employees in this and doing stuff for us to help us and I think this is exactly what's been shown is that, that the work that they're doing is actually going to have a major impact on what we do and part of our contribution back is then that when they tell us well what this is some good stuff that you should be doing to your underlying technologies or the way you're managing the data we'll actually bring about those we'll, we'll build those changes in and then you know we, we all sort of the game just lifts uh, Collectively, what I want to talk about is, is some actually some of the work that we do in this vast range of projects that we work on uh, at the SRC. Uh, we're fundamentally and primarily our, our basis is in research is archival science and cultural and social informatics as a, as a research area. Um, the beginnings were back in 1985 with the Australian Science Archives project, and that's still pretty much the way. And I think actually, as the decades have gone on, my archival hat and my research archival hat has got to become a bigger and stronger one rather than just a more generalised academic. A project that we did, um, what's going at the moment, uh, is with the Australian Ballet and one of the things that we had to do was to actually um, do a, a, a walk around survey. We got a bit of um, Maya Foundation funding um, to help them do this because they, they've got a 50 year celebration and they thought, well actually we need to be looking seriously at how we're preserving our archival materials and what does our history look like and that sort of thing. And this is the sort of, this is still basically the stuff that we, we find. There's some interesting things that we discovered just in the walk around survey. One is that the, um, the notion, there was, a, there was a really strong organising principle within the organisation and this is, this is something that is actually a bit unusual to, that you go somewhere and usually you see lots of chaos and mess and stuff in cellars and, and unmanaged you know, data records. At the, at the ballet, there was a very, everywhere we went, there was the same organising principle and of course it was the ballet. The ballet is, you know, the absolute essence of what they do and they are always looking back on the previous productions they've done of Swan Lake or whatever it might be. And so this is what we're actually seeing in their records. Though all of their departments like choreology and, and costume and design and, and the, uh, the scores and the music and the other bits of the administration were, were all siloed, and they had different ways of dealing with things within their, within their silos. But within that, there was always this notion of the ballet as the central organising principle. And that became a really good way for us to, to figure out what was the best thing to do for them. The traditional thing that sort of archivists do is basically take stuff that is invariably chaotic. You know, it's, it's the stuff that is, it, whether you're looking at the way people are working now or the way that, you know, the stuff that's accumulated in their garage, it's the controlling organising principle is usually in, in a person's mind and, and when you talk about organisations and they say they should know better, the thing you always say is there is no such thing as they when you're talking about organisations, there's just lots of thems and lots of chaos. But the role of the archivist is to turn that through some very strict proto um, protocols and principles of practice into something that is actually preservable. So you've got your acid free boxes and they're all beautifully labelled and they can sit on shelves and they will last for a long time. But you can see that the difference between how things are in real life and how things are in the archive is that you know, physically they're different and they say, are we actually misrepresenting the chaos of real life when we put things in a preservation environment? It's a, always an interesting challenge and that's where some of the rules of practice come in. But critical to having preservable stuff is having some sort of documentation and guide, so it's the metadata. So that's a big part of what we do. Uh, we still work in this field that, and this is exactly what um, we started off doing back in 1985, one of the first, or well, indeed on the, I think the 5th of March 1985, I rang McFarlane Burnett, who was the only living Nobel Prize winner in Australia at the time, and he was in Melbourne. And uh, Tim's heard this story so many times, it doesn't matter, but it's still a really, <laughs> it's a cool one. You know, I rang him up, I was young, and I just started this job, and I mustered all of the authority I could bring, because you know, here I was talking to an 85-year-old Nobel Prize winner, and I was a young person in their 20s and I, I said, look, hello, my name is Gavin McCarthy. I'm from the Australian Science Archives Project at the University of Melbourne and I was wondering what you were doing with your archival records. And literally he said to me, I was sitting here waiting for you to ring. 
<laughs> and it's quite, it's exactly what he said. So I said, well, I'll, maybe I should come around and visit, you know. And he died a few months later. But luckily we had set things up so that the archival process unfolded. It's now, it's still one of the most highly used collections at the University of Melbourne Archives. And a big part of that is that there is uh, a, um, a comprehensive guide, rich metadata that is in the public domain so people can discover and use it. So that's fundamentally still part of what we do. One of the things that we've had that we've had to reconceptualize or think, well, we had to con we had to articulate stuff that we'd learned over you know nearly a 30-year period, and that was that we were basically working in, in these three layers, and that this context layer, the records layer, and the data layer. And what we were finding that when, the more we were working in the e-research space with um, with researchers was that they were getting into real trouble in trying to do what they were trying to do because they were mixing up the metadata between these three layers. You know, you think of the context layer which is the one that I really love and it's the one that underpins the Encyclopedia of Australian Science and encoded archival context and the Finding Connect project and all these other things that we're doing. Uh, it, and it's that network informatics that that's based on. The, the records layer is the, is the, it's, it's the Burnett story. It's about what do you need to do to preserve stuff so that you've actually got records that are, can act as evidence that people can go back to. They can use with confidence, they can understand what they mean, or they can they have frames by which they can interpret and read them. And the data layer is the one that, in a sense, the digital technology and the sort of thing that Tim's been on about is, is that how do you utilise what's in those records? How do you get that data out and do really interesting analytical stuff that exposes things that are perhaps hidden in the record which would take massive amounts of work uh, to unearth otherwise. And we uh, had a we do quite a lot we do a lot of pro bono work. We get a little bit of funding from the university library, so we're an academic setter in the library, but most of the funding for what we do comes from grants, consultancies and things like that. Um, we yeah we did a little um, a pro bono well it was, a, it was a, a it's been a conversation that's happened over three cups of coffee with a group that was doing climate change historical climate change data extraction what they were doing is going into historical records digitised historical records from all over the place looking for any um, places where temperature was mentioned this is Australian records and then getting it into a format that where they, where they could uh, do something with it. So they were really doing, uh, examining records to extract data and they were trying to build online tools to do that and get a community of practice around doing the work. And they, would, they had a program, a computer scientist there and, and uh, using Ruby on Rails and they built something and it just wouldn't work, it was a real mess. And, and I looked at what they were doing and I said, look, you're just mixing up your three layers. And because you've got so many variables, you can't actually control them. So look, split them out. Use your Ruby on Rails for your data extraction process. Use Amica to manage your digital records because that's something they could just download. And then the context stuff we can either deal with in the Encyclopedia of Australian Science or in some other way. Once they realise, oh yeah, I see what you're doing. Um, yeah, it transforms something that was at the 11th hour of an ARC project that was going to fail into something that actually worked. So just thinking about your metadata in these layers has really helped us to communicate with people. Just to talk quickly about Swan Lake and the organisation principle, you know, the, the whole notion of Swan Lake within the, the ballet, you know, is that there are lots of different performances and Swan Lake actually has to sit there as a, as a concept and above the, uh, above the events. And so the sort of things we were doing for the ballet was, um, you know, we were mapping information creating an information framework, uh, looking at repertoire seasons, tours, events, people, organisations, collections, records and all sorts of other things. So really, you know, it was, we weren't restricted by any um, notion of what the entities were or what the elements were that needed to be mapped. The technology we use gives us that freedom to map what needs to be mapped and to map the relationships that need to be mapped for the purpose. And, you know, for Swan Lake there's all sorts of stuff that goes around a performance and we're also linking to external sources of which there are quite a few. The interesting thing, and I'm just going to finish with this I think, um, was that we did a presentation to the ballet uh, just a couple of weeks ago and what we'd done was put about 1400 entities into the into the database and but they were extremely thin. What they were rich in was interconnection but what they were thin in was story. So they were really short on narrative. Um, but we'd made that decision that the, the key thing that, they, that was missing 
within the organisation was knowledge of interconnection. So, for example, you'd look at this entry for this guy called Philip Adams, which is not the Philip Adams that you may know from the radio. This guy was an artistic director and a choreographer. And uh, the thing is that, okay, so well, we haven't, we haven't really got nothing about him at all, except that he was a, crea a creative, a word that they use, on, I can't read that over there. Um, oh no, a couple of, and he was, and anyway. But anyway, we, we showed this to the, uh, to the, to the board, uh, the executive of the, uh, the ballet. And we were pretty nervous because, you know, I thought this is like, are we just showing them back stuff that they already know? And the guy said, well, why have you spent $50,000 doing this? You know, what have we learned? But they went, ooh, ah, uh, that's amazing. How on earth did you do it? That will save us so much time. And so that decision, and the thing was that they all knew who Philip Adams was because you know, he's part of their community. But what they couldn't remember were all the things he was connected to. And when you applied that to all of the 1,400 entry entities that have worked in the ballet, all of a sudden it was a massive productivity gain to that organisation. So we went from a, a um, well, it was a philanthropic grant for a one-off project to, to, you know, within 10 minutes of being in the boardroom, of saying, okay, now how do we turn this into a two, three-year project, which is internally funded and, and beca it becomes integrated into the way the ballet works. So that was an exciting moment for us. Uh, at the other end is the Find and Connect stuff where the actual detailed narrative is not known. The community has lost this knowledge and so that's where we've been using historians, using exactly the same technology we're all, not only are we just mapping the interrelationships, but we're also writing deep narratives and often sort of quite conflicting narratives simultaneously about some of these organisations. And yeah, we're back to the maps that we had before. So that's, um, that's pretty well it.